Hey guys, Will here. So the McLaren GT3 wheel from Fnatic has been one of their most popular wheels historically. And when this was uh, discontinued, probably almost about a year ago now, a lot of people were disappointed. Anytime you see one of these wheels pop up, on any sort of secondhand market, it always gets sold pretty much immediately. So today we're very excited to introduce to you guys the brand new V2 McLaren wheel. Now from what I can see, and I haven't unboxed it yet, it does look pretty much identical on the outside to the old wheel. So if you're familiar with this one, then this one isn't gonna come as a surprise to you. But under the hood, they have made some pretty significant improvements, including new magnetic paddles on the back, uh, a different design for the analog paddles, uh, new encoders as well, so rather than and the 12-way uh, multi-position switches that we had before. We now have rotary encoders that can also be used as multi-position switches. A slightly different OLED display. And uh, on the back as well, this is the old V1 wheel. We've got a completely revised actual quick release this time. The uh, mounting solution that we had on the old wheel, I wouldn't really call a quick release because it did require clamping down. That has changed now as well. So today we're gonna to be unboxing, taking a look at and going for a drive with the brand new McLaren GT3 V2 wheel from Fnatic. Let's get going. All right, let's get started on unboxing this guy. Now, just a couple of points while we're getting started on this. Pricing wise, we're looking at 199.95 euros or US dollars or 349.90 if you're in Australia. So that is the pricing. Let's open this guy up. So we've got our usual Fnatic stickers in there as you guys have come to expect. We've also got, I'll just put the box aside for a second here, our quick start guide. And that explains how this new quick release system works as well, which we'll be taking a look at in just a moment. So this gives us all the details of the new quick release mechanism as well as the rotor encoders, button assignments, calibration, and all those things. So very detailed, and I do always recommend that you read through this thoroughly before getting started. It answers 99% of the questions that I see people asking in online forums. So that is important. You will also need to upgrade your wheelbase to the latest firmware as well. So just make sure you're aware of that. So let's grab the wheel out. I'll grab the additional button caps out too while we're here. Get rid of the box. All right, so pop these off. And it does look absolutely identical as we expected to the V1, at least at face value. So, move those aside as well. So yeah, I mean, if you've seen the McLaren GT3 V1 wheel, this looks exactly the same. But for those of you who aren't familiar, it is a plastic construction. So although it does have that kind of nice carbon fibery looking uh, pattern on the front. That is just sort of like an etched plastic. So, I mean, it actually looks really good. I mean, it's it's a nice effect. It reflects the, ni the light nicely as well. So as we kind of turn it from side to side, you can see it kind of reflecting the various light patterns there. But the thing that I think people love about this wheel the most, and what we uh, here at Booster Media grew to love as well, is just the ergonomics of it. So all the buttons are easily reached with your thumbs as you're sort of holding it as well. So you can see, you know, I can reach those ones with relative ease. I can roll across and reach the toggle switches. And yeah, just overall, it's a really, really nicely designed wheel. And it does make sense that it is a very well ergonomically designed wheel because it is an exact replica of the wheel that we have inside the real life race car with the exception of the funky switch. And uh, I think in the real race car, instead of the OLED display, we have a fourth rotor encoder button there. So let's just quickly run through all the inputs that we have here, seven way funky switch. So down, up, left, right, rotary encoder and push button. We've got a couple of toggle switches here, so up and down, really useful for adjusting things like brake bias on the fly in the absence of rotary encoders for the thumbs. Uh, but you can reach those relatively easily when you're driving as well, so that's all good. We've got one, two, three, four, five regular push buttons, and those have a nice tactile feel to them as well, so exactly the same as what you've come to expect on any other club sport wheel from Fnatic, as well as the CSL Elite wheels, so no problems there. Uh, these little button caps are removable as well, so we can simply just kind of pull on it, and it clicks off like so. So orange buttons in these locations, and then gray buttons underneath these guys. So rotor encoders wise, one of the things that we did mention is these are now 
rotor encoders that spin all the way around. This one is still a multi-position selection switch for the uh, function of the analog paddles, which we'll take a look at later on. But yeah, these rotate all the way around now, and that is really important because a lot of sim titles don't uh, understand inputs from multi-position switches. So these can be used as a pulse for up and down. What that basically means is every time you move the switch, it tells the game to move up one position. Every time you move down, it tells the game to move down one position. And the difference there really being that it doesn't actually know what position it's in at all times. So a lot of sim titles that aren't compatible with multi-position switches, what happens is it loses track of where it is and then it just doesn't understand the input anymore or what you're seeing on the wheel doesn't correspond with the correct setting inside the game. So configurable through the software now, you can change between multi-position switch mode or rotary encoder mode, which is important. The OLED display now is also white instead of the blue that we had on the previous one. And otherwise everything is pretty much the same. So these two buttons as well got a really nice tactile feel to them, really good solid click. And they've also got these little uh, surrounds on them as well so you don't accidentally press them. And these are particularly useful for VR as well so you can easily feel where you are. And again, a really nice solid click. So otherwise, 300 millimeter diameter, which uh, I find to be pretty much ideal as a versatile wheel for all sorts of different styles of drive. Now obviously you're not going to be doing rally style or drifting with a wheel like this, but for Formula style as well as GT3 and GT4 style cars, this is perfectly fine. Good diameter, it's not too twitchy, not too sensitive, anything bigger than that and it does start to become a little bit difficult to drive Formula style cars. So this is a really good all-rounder wheel for those who are only wanting to purchase one wheel. Uh, as long as you're not doing rally or drifting, then you'll find that you should be able to use this wheel for most different styles of driving, which is obviously important. Rubber grips as well, they've got a little bit of squish in them. Not the squishiest grips I've felt in the world, but I mean, driving with the McLaren V1 wheel for the past 18 months now that we've had it, uh, always found it to be very comfortable. The grips mold really nicely to the contours of your hand as well. So you can see you've got the little indentations there where your thumbs sit. And yeah, just overall, it's a very, very comfortable wheel. The throw to the shifters as well, and that is one thing that has changed significantly. So we'll spend a little bit of time with that. You can easily reach them. While they're not adjustable in terms of their distance away, they do have a significantly better feel now that I noticed straight away over the V1 wheel. So we'll grab the V1 wheel over again. And uh, I'm just trying to get this in a shot that's gonna work for you guys. You can see on the V1, it's just a contact switch and quite a short throw about, uh, we'll put the measurements up on the screen for you, but probably about a three or four millimeter throw in that. Whereas on the V2 wheel, We've got a nice mechanical magnetic action on that, and that's probably throwing, I'd say, six or seven millimeters now, but it is a noticeable difference. And one other thing that I notice as well straight away, with the, uh, with the paddles on the V1 wheel, it is a rocker style switch, so you can push or pull to change gear on the one side if you choose to do that, or push or pull on either side should you wish to do it that way. But what I found was that pushing against the mechanical switch it did feel a little bit solid and it wasn't really comfortable to do a push-pull style. It was always sort of gravitating towards using the rocker in that fashion. Whereas with the V2, what I'm noticing straight away is it is a little bit more comfortable to push on due to that magnetic resistance. So that is definitely a significant difference there, something that you will definitely appreciate every time you drive. Whether or not it's something that is significant enough to warrant upgrading from a V1 to a V2, uh, I'll have to comment on that once we go for a drive, but at face value at least, it definitely does feel like it's a significant improvement. Now one other thing that we do notice before we move on to the quick release is the honeycomb structure inside the analog paddles now. So if we hold that where you can see it there, you can see that honeycomb pattern, which adds a lot more strength and does make the analog paddle feel a little bit more solid to pull on. It's not a massive difference, but I think it is a difference that people will appreciate. So if we have a look at the V1 by comparison, it feels exactly the same in terms of the mechanical resistance against it, but there's a little bit of twist there. If we pull on it a little bit harder, it just feels a little bit cheaper. So again, just a, it's a very, very small and subtle improvement, but it is an improvement worth noting nonetheless. So the most significant thing here is obviously the difference in the quick release. So let's flip them around now and take a closer look at the two. So on the V1 wheel, we had this mechanism where you basically push the wheel onto the hub and then had to insert a little fixing screw inside this little kind of mechanical 
spring-loaded retention clip here. So it kind of pushes flat like that, and then the screw goes through the bottom there. And then we have this little thingy in here that we pop out, and the retention screw actually sat inside this for safekeeping when you weren't using it. So we pop this off. And it was quite a clever design. We had a little Allen key here that we could use, and then the screw itself would sit there. So you could keep it safe and you wouldn't lose it. But it was a pain to work with. It wasn't something that you would want to sort of, you know, be, a, be inserting and then taking off. And if you're changing wheels all the time, it was just something that you didn't want to have to do. So if we have a look at the V2 wheel now, on the back here, you can see there's no longer that uh, insert. So it's just a flat panel across the back here now. And instead, we now have this newly designed rotating quick release, which is a genuine quick release. You can take this on and off very easily without any tools. And if you saw our video that we did on the WRC wheel, you would have seen that we were really, really impressed with this. We will touch on all that again in today's video. So we'll pop off the little sticker here, a little warning sticker that says, it says stop turning in big bold letters once the quick release ring completely covers the indicator line. Over tightening may result in difficulty to loosen and damage. Read quick guide instructions. So yes, as I said before, do read those quick guide instructions. So there's a little indicator line that you can see there which sort of indicates when it's fully tightened. So you wanna tighten it down to that line. And we'll show you this on the actual wheelbase itself in just a moment as well. But the idea is you slip it on, you tighten that down, and uh, yeah, there's very, very little flex in there, if any at all. So very, very clever design. And I do hope that we see this design in some form at least carried across to the club sport and uh, podium wheels a little bit later on. Obviously, we did see that newly designed quick release on the upcoming BMW M4 GT3 wheel, and that's very interesting. We don't have any further details on that yet. Now, one thing that I should mention, we'll just set this uh, V1 wheel aside again as well. Um, with the V1 wheel as well as the V2 wheel, we are limited to low torque mode on a DD1 and a DD2 when we're using these plastic quick releases. And uh, when I say plastic, I should say this is a glass injected plastic, so it is a little bit stronger than standard plastic. But what you can do, and it is a separate accessory, but you can purchase a Club Sport quick release adapter, which essentially just bolts on the back. So this comes off, unscrew it here, and then this one just bolts on in place. So when we bolt this one on, what it's doing is it's actually activating a little switch internally on the wheel, which tells it that this is attached and um, to enable high torque mode on the DD1 and DD2. So if you are wanting to use those modes, just be aware that you will need to purchase this as an optional accessory. So just so you guys are aware of that. But yeah, I think that covers everything that we need to in terms of a closer look at the wheel. So let's get it all up on the wheelbase now. We'll show you how the quick release works in practice and uh, then go for a drive. All right, so time to go for a drive. So we're gonna start off by showing you how this quick release works. We've got it on the fully unlocked position at the moment. As we tighten it down, you can see there's a little line in there. So we're gonna tighten it down to the line. We're not gonna go past the line because there are some little plastic prongs in there that we don't want to over torque and over tension and damage. So get it back the right way around again. There we go. <laughs> Loosen it off and it simply slides on to, and we're running a Club Sport wheelbase 2.5 today. If you wanna see how this interfaces with the DD1 or DD2, go and check out our uh, WRC wheel review that we did a couple of months ago where we showed that. I'll link it up the top of the screen for you. So we just wind this down until we're covering the white line. And there we go, we're completely mounted. You can see the Fnatic logo is showing up there now and we have access to our tuning menu. So that's all good. And if I quickly show you again, you can see this is all running live. It doesn't crash the game or anything. When we pull the wheel off, we'll put it back on. Back on, logo comes straight up, tighten it down. And we're good to go. So look, there's a little bit of flex there. I think that's just down to the fact that we're mounting hard up against, you know, plastic here. So it's a plastic quick release with glass injection. Uh, and that seems to be nice and solid. That's not moving around on the base at all, just like what we saw with the WRC wheel. But there's a little bit of flex just in the mounting surface on the back here where we're joining up to the plastic housing. So I think that's, you know, well within the realms of acceptable for a wheel at this price point, and I don't see it as being an issue when we're driving. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But it's about the same amount of flex as we had with the metal quick release on the V1 wheel that we had installed. Um, that was coming from the actual you know, sleeve itself, whereas this is just the plastic interface at the back. But quickly run you through the menu options here too. We'll um, go through the tuning menu. So same deal as what we've had in all of our other Fnatic wheels. And again, if you wanna see more detail on how all this works, how all the settings work, go and check out our uh, video that I've linked at the top now on Fanalabs and the configuration, but we can go in, 
we can go into each setting and then adjust it using our funky switch. Very convenient. We don't have any LED strip on this wheel, so we don't have any rev lights or anything like that. But we don't have those on the genuine item that comes, you know, in the real life race car either. So it is an accurate representation in that sense. We'll exit back out and uh, let's go for a drive. All right, let's head out here. So we've got Fanalab running up on the display here, which allows us to show various different functions. We've got speed, uh, gear and position showing up as well at various different times. So every time we change gear, you'll see it flashes the gear and then changes back to speed again. That's all configured through the Fanalab software. We've got other videos where we've run you through all of that detail as well with the uh, clutch bite point. We've got another video where I showed you all of that as well. So I'll link those videos down in the description below for you guys. Um, we do have a couple of different modes available here, which is worth just quickly running through though. So we've got the clutch and bite point here, which is where we use the uh, analog paddles and we can set the bite point. We've got a clutch and handbrake mode. So clutch and handbrake, that's good for rally style driving. Although I don't really know whether you'd be wanting to do rallying on this wheel specifically. Uh, we've got a brake and throttle mode. So if you have a disability, you can use the paddles for your brake and throttle. And I actually do know a few people that do that and uh, swear by it. So that actually does seem to work quite well. And then we also have mappable analog axes as well. So if you wanna map the, uh, map the paddles to any other function that you wanna have, like looking around the cabin even, you could do that if you wanted to. So there's all sorts of things you can do. Let's go back to bite point again now. But I think the, the main thing that I wanna focus on in this segment, driving testing, is primarily the ergonomics of the wheel and uh, you know how it varies from the previous model, the, the differences there as well. Because I know that you know a lot of people are gonna be interested in whether I feel like this is a worthwhile upgrade over the previous model. So we're gonna address that, but First thing I want to say is just how awesome this wheel is in terms of ergonomics. It really is incredibly comfortable to drive with. All the indentations and uh, you know cutouts for your hands are very, very comfortable. I find driving with and without gloves as well. I spent a bit of time driving just before without gloves. Quite comfortable on your hands. You do tend to get a little bit sweaty with the rubber, but just the right amount of squish there. It's not too, it's not too squishy, not too soft, just right. And um, yeah, just the 300 millimeter diameter just feels absolutely spot on for driving these GT3 style cars. As I said before at the start of the video, you can get away with um, with formula style cars as well. Wouldn't be do using it for rally or drifting. Obviously you can't slip the wheel through your hands, but just a really, really comfortable wheel to use. And ergonomically as well, all the buttons are really easy to reach. We've got a few things configured here now. We've got Plus and minus here adjusts our ABS level, level. So we've got up and down. We've got our brake bias on the left as I drive off the track, not paying attention to what I'm doing. And those are just outside the range of your thumb. So you're not gonna bump them by accident when you're driving around, but uh, you can roll across like that and reach them quite comfortably. So that's all fine. And then we've got our rotary encoders here as well. So we do have to roll our hands off and I mean, you know, for, for some formula style driving, so for F1 2020, for example, I do prefer having the thumb encoders, you know, where, the, where, the, where they can be easily accessed with your thumbs inside the wheel here. You know, it makes it easy for changing things like ERS and uh, fuel trim without having to take your eyes off the road at all or sort of adjust your hands. So you can sort of do it mid corner, but it's still relatively easy to do with this wheel. We just roll across and you can see here, we've got our engine map changing and our traction control setting changing. So very, very easy to operate. And again, that's, um, that change that we've got now where we're able to you know, have these as rotary encoders as well as um, multi-position switches means that you can use it in pretty much every single SIM title now. Um, and it's not a problem. Whereas with the V1 wheel, it was a bit of an issue. Now, in terms of the flex, there is a little bit of flex there, as we mentioned before. Um, you know, about the same amount of flex as we come to expect from most Fnatic wheels at the moment. Um, and again, like, it's not something that I notice when I'm driving and I've said that about all the wheels. Um, you know, unless you're paying specific attention to it, it's just really not an issue. But it is there and it's important to acknowledge that it is there. So just so you guys are aware of that, but I certainly don't feel like it's sort of absorbing any of the fidelity through the, through the uh, force feedback or anything like that. Obviously the force feedback is rotational, whereas the flex is from side to side sort of pushing and pulling, so not a problem there. Now the other major difference that we need to talk about here is the, um, is the shifters. Now we've obviously switched from uh, 
the sort of mechanical shifters that we had before to magnetic paddles now. It is still operating micro switches internally, but these have a much nicer feeling to them now. And I think probably between the between the feeling of the shifters and the new quick release, I think those, those are probably going to be the two most compelling reasons that people might want to look at upgrading from their V1 wheel to the V2. Now, I would say that, you know, while it is a significant change and definitely a massive step forward, it's probably not enough that I would rush out and go and upgrade unless I could get a really good price for my V1 wheel. So I feel like it's more sort of, you know, they've, they've discontinued the V1 now. They've addressed a lot of the issues that people had previously with it. And they've released a V2 now to sort of as a replacement for the V1 rather than as an upgrade to the V1. I think would probably be the best way I can describe that. So for me, you know, owning a, owning a V1 wheel, I probably, you know, wouldn't be rushing out to buy this one, particularly if you've already gone out and invested in the metal quick release. And remembering as well that if you're running this on a DD1 or DD2, you will need the metal quick release anyway to get the full torque. Um, if you're running on a club spot wheelbase 2.5 or a, C or a um, CSL Elite, then that's uh, a moot point. But yeah, I think that, you know, for those of you who already own the V1 wheel, you might want to save your pennies and you know wait for something, wait for something better. But I mean, this you know as a more entry level wheel in the Fnatic range, I do think that this is fantastic value for money because it just it ticks all those boxes. Ergonomically, it's very comfortable. The paddles feel really good. You know, it's got all the functionality in terms of you know your analog axes. You've got your OLED display on the front as well. And it really is you know it's it's hard to go past the value for money that you get with this wheel. I mean. You know, if you, have, if you have one of these and say a BMW GT2 wheel or something like that, that you can use for your rally style and drifting and some other sort of GT style cars where you don't want to have the uh, more GT3 or formula style wheel, I really think that's got all the bases covered. And you know, those are probably the only two wheels that you would ever really need. I mean, it would be nice to have an RPM gauge on the wheel. Most people are running in rigs where you can see the RPM gauge on the screen anyway, or you know, have an external dash or a smartphone or something like that that you can use. So I don't really see it being a problem. I mean, again, remembering that this is a replica of the real life wheel, the real life wheel doesn't have rev lights on it either. So it's kind of like if they put them on there, then people will complain that it's not a real replica. If they don't have them there, then people complain about the functionality. But remember again, you can configure in Fanalab to have the display show your RPM as well if you wish to do that. So, you know, you do have that option should you want to do it. And with um, aftermarket software like um, Fanaleds as well, there's a few other options that you can do. Although um, Fanalab is very close to that in terms of its functionality, if not more advanced in many ways these days. So, look, I guess, yeah, overall, I'm just, I'm really impressed with the wheel. But again, for the price point, I'm happy that they've addressed all the issues that um, people had previously. The quick release is actually a quick release now so that's amazing um, and also I know a lot of people had problems with the electronics in the uh, in the previous generation wheel as well now admittedly we never had that issue um, we've been running the v1 wheel Tom was actually using it as his main wheel for about probably three or four months and never missed a beat for him but I know quite a few people did um, specifically have the paddles stop working for them and there were quite a few warranty claims so I'm hoping that the um, revised electronics internally address that as well. I'm sure that they will. Um, obviously, it's not something that we can really comment on, you know, in the first few days that we've been testing out this wheel. But if we do have any problems with it, obviously, I'll let you guys know. But, you know, to me, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like a major upgrade to the V1. It's not meant to be. It's meant to be a replacement for the V1. And, you know, the fact that they have addressed all of those little concerns from the V1, they've improved the electronics, improved the feeling of the shifters, you know, reinforced the analog paddles, changed the uh, OLED to white instead of blue as well, which is a nice touch. We've got the rotary encoders now instead of just multi-position switches. And um, yeah, just overall, I think that this is a really, really good value wheel.
Okay, so conclusions on the V2 McLaren GT3 wheel from Fnatic. So, look, I think that this this is going to tick a lot of boxes for a lot of people. All the reasons why people enjoyed and liked the GT3 original wheel so much kind of carry across into this one, but with obviously the added benefit of the improvements that they made. I mean, the, the biggest complaints that I saw with the original one were around the quick release that wasn't really a quick release, the mounting solution, which has now been improved with this new design, which does actually work really well. And as we saw in the video, actually works a lot better than the metal quick release in terms of the flex in the hub itself, particularly on DD1s and DD2s, as we've seen before when we looked at the uh, WRC wheel from Fnatic that uses the same quick release. So that's a big improvement. The multi-position switches also being able to be used as rotary encoders makes a big difference as well. That's going to increase compatibility for a bunch of other titles that didn't support the multi-position switches previously. So that is a big positive as well. The uh, magnetic shifters do feel significantly better than they did before. The analog paddles, look, I didn't really notice a massive amount of difference in terms of the driving experience, but they do have that new honeycomb design internally, which does make them a little stronger. And just overall, I feel like this is a wheel that offers all of the basic core functionality that any sim race is going to need. It's got the display, it's got the analog paddles, magnetic paddle shifters, uh, you know, all the buttons feel really good. It's got the seven-way funky switch on it. And really, I just feel like this wheel ticks all of the necessary boxes for a wheel at this price point. And uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a really, really popular one. So if you do decide you want to pick one of these up, we do have some links down in the description below where you can do that. And a small percentage of the profits from those sales come back to helping out with the channel, which is what keeps us running. So thank you very much for your support there. But uh, yeah, I think that pretty much covers everything we need to for today's video. So leave a thumbs up if you've enjoyed it. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel as well so you don't miss future videos. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye.